Now we're going over uh, the C3 reflection, which primarily covers probability, normal distribution, and getting val uh, getting probability no values from probabilities. So we'll be doing a mix of problems here. So a soft drink machine can be regulated. So discharge is an average of X ounces per cup. If the ounces of fill are normally distributed with a standard deviation of 0.4 ounces, what value should X be set at so that 98% of six ounce cups will not overflow? I struggled with question one. I wasn't sure where to start. The only thing I could do was draw the, I believe they mean, meant the normal graph. So here's the initial normal, <coughs> excuse me, the initial normal distribution. We know the standard deviation is 0.4 ounces, but we don't know the mean. In fact, we're trying to figure it out. So we want 98% of cups to not overflow. Now, how do I know that I'm shading to the left? Well, because I want 98% to be below 6 ounces, right? So the high part, 2% are allowed to go over 6 ounces, but the other 98% we want below 6 ounces. So I know... Uh, trying to figure out the mean here, that that's six ounces right there. So we want 98% of cups to the left of this z-score, whatever that z-score is. Now, the question is, the normal model with um, 0.4 as a standard deviation, I don't know how to set it. So I'm going to have to go ahead, and I'm going to use a staplet to show you how to get a z-score for... 98% uh, when I don't know the uh, mean. In fact, I'm going to use the standardized model. So on Staplet, go to normal distributions, but instead, this time I'm going to calculate a value corresponding to an area. So it's one of the top two on the drop down boxes. I'm using a standardized score, partly because I don't know the mean and I don't know the standard deviation. Plot my distribution. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate a value. So the left tail is 0.98 because we want 98% to the left. Calculate your value. And by the way, if you hit your little labels on your plot here, then you actually can see there's the area 0.98 and it gives you a z-score of 0.25. So that's pretty cool. So now we want 98% to the left of this z-score that we got, which was 2.05. And so I'm going to substitute, yeah, I substitute in the 2.05 for the z. 6 is the value, mean is my unknown, and 0.4 is my standard deviation. Do some algebra, multiply both sides by 0.4, and then add 6 to both sides. And we get, um, actually add the mean over here, and then subtract 0.82 from both sides and we get 5.18 ounces. So again, the trick was to use z-scores. There's a reason I've been having you use the standardized model instead of an unstandardized model because it won't always work if you don't know it. But the standardized model, we always know z-scores for any given percentage. Number two, suppose that scores on a certain IQ test are normally distributed with a mean of 110 and standard deviation of 15. Then about 40% of the scores are between uh, what two numbers? Okay. Um, so a lot again, again, a lot of people are confused because let's see, we have a mean, we have a standard deviation. So what we're going to do is they mean the middle 44%. So that might help you right there. We could find the lower Z or the upper Z, either one, and 40% in the middle. 60% 60, 60 spill on the outside, 30% on the left, and 30% on the right. So we want 70% below the upper Z, all right? All right, make sure that you are not calculating an area, that you're calculating a value. Again, we're going backwards from area to a value. We're using the standardized model again because we don't know either the mean or the standard deviation. And... Uh, well, actually, we could have done it here. I'll show you that in a little sec. But let me do this with the standardized model because that is what Mrs. Overman likes. And we wanted the middle 50, uh, 40 percent. So now, actually, there are a couple ways to do this. I could say, hey, I've got 0.3 percent of the area to the left. 
and let me go ahead and show my labels, and you see I have a z-score of negative 0.52. Um, I could say I have, uh, so that's my lower z. I could do to the right, and that would give me my upper z. I could say central and give me the middle 40%, which is really what we're talking about, and you have both of your z values here. And so we can find the z is negative 0.52 and the positive z is 0.5, uh, point, positive 0.52. Uh, here's an interesting thing. You can actually put the mean in, but I'm gonna, I want you to be able to calculate these from C's because this is not always going to work. But if you're doing a multiple choice and you put in the actual mean and the actual standard deviation, you can actually have it calculate your values. And the cool thing is, so there's your values. These are the answers, 102.13 to 117.87. And it also gives you the Z scores right here. So, beautiful. So Z lower is inverse norm on your calculator, but I just used the staplet to find that for you, and it's negative 0.52. And if you do Z upper, it should be symmetric. It's positive 0.52, all right? So we can find our values, and we're going to substitute in value. Now, I'm rearranging the equation for you. So it's value equals mean plus Z times standard deviation. So uh, value equals 110 plus minus 0.52 times 15, 102.2. And then the second value, working it out, we get 117.8, which works out to be E. Okay. Number three, the five number summary of the distribution of 316 scores on a statistics exam is 0, 26, 31, 36, and 50. The scores are approximately normal. What is the approximate value of the standard deviation of the test? And this throws a lot of kids off. Number three, very tough question here. Unless you recall that Q1 and Q3 are actually, if you remember, that, don't use 0 and 50 because that won't work. But Q1 and Q3, or even, yeah, I just use Q1 and Q3, or even uh, the mean, we could figure some things out. So we're going to use the median to approximate the mean, right? Because it's approximately normally distributed. It's also the midpoint of Q1 and Q3. So it seems to be a good idea. So 50% of the data is between Q1 and Q3. And I can find the z-scores for those using Staplet. So, and actually I find these z-scores a lot, it's negative 0.67 and positive 0.67. So 50% of data, the middle 50% tends to be an interesting problem. So we substitute in, and we're going to substitute in for Q1 for the lower, right? We know the z-score, we know the value, we know the mean, because we're using the median as our mean. And then we can just solve for the standard deviation, and we get 7.46 which is approximately 7.5. Below are the cumulative relative frequency graphs for the price distributions of homes in the towns of Pleasantville and Middletown. Compare the median and interquartile range of the price of homes in these two towns. So one thing you have to, this is a cumulative distribution function, all right? So one of the things you have to remember is let's get the median first. Medians are easy. Medians are at, um, and we know the min's for both. Oh, we got to do the min. Yes. So min for both is around 80, right? There's Q1. It's at 25%, the 25th percentile. So it's about 150 and 210 for both curves. How did I find that? Let me pull up my laser pointer for you. Down at the 25th percentile right there, okay? And I can find the median. The median's roughly 170 and 230. And then Q3 is roughly 190 and 240. So the median price of homes in Middleton, town or whatever it is, is about 230,000 from right here, is higher than the median price of homes in Pleasantville. 170,000. Notice I have values. I compared. I said one is higher than the other. There is less variability in the price of homes in Middletown because the prices of homes in Middletown has an IQR of 30,000 and the prices of homes in Pleasantville has an IQR of 40,000. 
Now, one of these distributions is strongly skewed to the left. Which one is it and how can you tell? Okay, so because the curve is less steep for the lower priced homes um, than it is for the higher priced homes, the distribution of prices in Middletown right here, so most of the data here is up in the high end. And, but it does have data going all the way down. So it's helpful to know that min is around 80. Um, so that you actually do have data points on this one down here, but most of the piles right here, because you got 75% of the data is right in this area, right? Whereas 75% of the data here is more spread out. So Middletown is more strongly skewed left. So this is a cumulative a distribution function because it shows you probabilities as they go up to 100%. The graph below is a normal probability plot for the amount of rainfall in acre feet obtained from 26 randomly selected clouds that were seeded with silver oxide. Which of the following statements about shape of the rainfall distribution is true? Hint, note that the axes are switched from what we did in notes. So first of all, um, Let's go ahead and look. We're going to take a look at where um, the different z-scores are. So I'm like, okay, so negative one z-score is there, zero z-score. So that's roughly the median, right? That's cute. Well, that's one z-score down, and then that's one z-score up. I shouldn't call it the median. I should call it the average because technically that's what it is, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a normal distribution, and I'm going to put these values down here. All right, so most of the data is in the lower number. So this is about maybe, that's maybe 10 because it's really close. Who knows? It's a low number. Then the average is roughly, let's see, about 100 maybe. And then this number is going to be all the way to 750. All right, so you, can you see how these are kind of tightly packed and now it's starting to spread out. So that means that you have a big amount of data right here kind of crunched in, and then you just have a little bit of data to the right. So that tells you that it is skewed right. A policeman records the speed of the cars on a certain section of roadway with a radar gun. The histogram below shows the distribution of speeds for 251 cars. The maximum value is 35 miles per hour. If the value 35 miles per hour, so this value right here, was actually 29, how would the mean and the standard deviation change? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece of data and move it. It's over here now. All right. Well, my mean would probably go down a little, right, because I don't have this pulling up the average. Now, by the way, don't say it changes drastically. I saw that on several tests and quizzes, and it's like, uh, you got one data point out of a bunch of data points, 251 cars. Don't overstate, all right? So then, yes, the mean would lower probably just slightly, honestly. And the spread would just get a little bit less. So the typical distance goes down. So the mean would decrease and the standard deviation would decrease. No need to say drastically. Don't say things you can't back up. Number eight. There are 10 red marbles and eight green marbles in a jar. If you take three marbles from the jar without replacement, what is the probability that they are all red? Okay, so this is a simple uh, compound events probability. And we're gonna just say, okay, what's the probability the first marble I pick is red? Well, there are 10 red out of 18 marbles. And then the next one, if I pick a red the first time, I only have nine red to pick from out of 17 and eight out of 16, so you multiply these all through and you get 0.147. Okay, now we're gonna go on to problems nine through 13, and this graph will be very helpful for the first couple. Um, the cumulative relative frequency graph shows the distribution of the percent of foreign-born residents in 50 states, all right? Estimate the interquartile range of this distribution. So you need to find Q1, all right, that appears to be about four. And then you have to find Q3, so that's going to be about 75%. And that's about 14. 
and then when I subtract those both, I get 10% for B. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Number 10, Arizona had 15.1% foreign-born residents in this particular year. What is Arizona's percentile? So I'm going to go up from 15.1 and hang left, and I'd say it's about the 85th percentile. So that's pretty straightforward. Just make sure you use the graph and you read it. Um, why is the graph fairly flat between 20% and 27%? Well, basically, that's there are very few states that had this amount. And so some people are like, oh, but it's getting close to 100%. Technically, it can be steep near 100%. Just because it's close to 100% means doesn't mean it has to be flat. All right. But what this means is there's very little uh, change, which means there's very little new data here. So there were very few states that had 20 to 27.5 percent foreign-born residents. Montana had 1.9 percent foreign-born residents. Find and interpret the z-score for Montana. Well, z-score is value minus mean divided by standard deviation. So our value is 1.9 minus 8.73 divided by my standard deviation. Here's the 8.73 for the mean, and there's my SD. So I get negative 1.12. Now, why isn't B the correct answer? No context, people. We find and interpret for Montana. Must have information about Montana. Numbers are not good enough as an answer. Very rare. All right. New York has a standardized score of 2.10. Find the percent of the foreign-born residents in New York at that time. So we're going to say Z equals value minus mean. And we already had the mean and the standard deviation from that previous graph. Here, let me go back. So here's my mean. There's my standard deviation. So I substitute them in. And the only thing I don't know is New York. So we do some algebra. Multiply both sides by 6.12. Add 8.73 to both sides and we get 21.852% foreign-born residents. Number 14, apples growing in a certain orchard have weights that are normally distributed with a standard deviation of 2.2 ounces. What is the mean weight if 80% of the apples weigh less than 9.1 ounces? So we have to figure out using the standardized distribution, uh, let's see, yeah, because we don't know the mean, we have to use standardized, because if you don't know the mean, or the standard deviation, <clears throat> you must use z-scores, all right? So we want to find 80% to the left, right? Now, if you use Staplet, uh, z for 9.1 ounces is, and that's a calculator contribution there, is 0.84, all right? So it's 0.84 if you go use the Staplet and then go find value, all right? And then z equals value minus mean divided by standard deviation. Go ahead and substitute. Multiply both sides by 2.2. Uh, uh, go ahead and solve for the mean, and you get 7.25 ounces. The weights of 9-ounce bags of a particular brand of potato chips can be modeled by a normal distribution with a mean of 9.12 ounces and a standard deviation of 0.05 ounces. Sketch the normal density curve. Label the mean and the points that are 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations from the mean. Now, you could plug these in Staplet, and it will give you the whole model. We'll go ahead and do it manually. So, um, so we're going to make an unstandardized model. I'm going to put my mean right there in the middle, and then I'm going to go up by one standard deviation and fill in the graphs. And then I'm going to go down by one standard deviation and fill in the graph. So the answer is graph C on your multiple choice. That should be the one that matches.